Um, thank you very much, Leighton, for the kind invitation. Um, <clears throat> so what happens operationally as one approaches the Planck scale? Let's just review a very basic argument. If you want to resolve a distance more and more precisely, then a smaller position uncertainty will trigger a larger momentum uncertainty. And eventually, as the momentum uncertainty becomes very large, since momentum curves space just like energy does, we expect a curvature uncertainty. And eventually, if we don't know exactly what the curvature is between two points, how can we know what their distance is either? So we start with trying to resolve distances very accurately. We end up increasing momentum uncertainty, increasing the curvature uncertainty, and that eventually leads to an uncertainty in distances again. So um, a back of the envelope calculation shows that there ought to be a limit to how far the notion of distance makes sense, probably to, down to about 10 to the minus 35 meters. Now, what then is the structure of space-time? There's a paradox. On one hand, general relativity would have it that space um, is a differentiable manifold. Fields live on a differentiable manifold. On the other hand, quantum field theory doesn't really uh, agree with that. And quantum field theory would be much better defined. In fact, it would be def well defined only if it is defined on a lattice. So how can we reconcile the two? Is, is general relativity winning, or is quantum field theory ultimately winning? Well, there are many proposed resolutions to this um, conundrum. And one possible resolution is in this suggestion. Studies in quantum gravity and string theory have put up the possibility that the uncertainty principle might be slightly modified. And instead of being hyperbolic and approaching this axis asymptotically and approaching that axis asymptotically, there might be a finite gap here so that we cannot make delta x arbitrarily small. <clears throat> that would be, in a way, the, the simplest way of implementing the idea that we cannot resolve distances arbitrarily accurately. We are not, resor we are not resorting uh, to any assumptions that go beyond the established theories of quantum theory and re general relativity by saying that it's just a quantum uncertainty. It's just the usual quantum uncertainty that cannot be made any smaller than a finite minimum uncertainty. Now, <clears throat> this structure also arises. Uh, it arises not just from various studies of quantum gravity and string theory, <clears throat> where it comes from t-duality. It also comes from quantum groups and non-commutative geometry. Um, this came out of my PhD thesis. If you take the quantum group SUQ2, uh, SUQN and define raising and lowering operator commutation relations that are symmetric, that are preserved under the action of that quantum group, then you pick up some non-trivial commutator here. And once you have those A and A dagger operators, you can then define position and momentum operators simply by taking their real part or the Hermitian part and the anti Hermitian part. And then you find modified commutation relations for the X and the P. They are a little complicated. I spare you the trouble of reading them all. Here is the equation that you get for one dimension. If you just reduce what you've seen with the N dimensions to one dimension, this is what you obtain. And you see that phase space is changed. It's a bit like what Laurent was saying a little earlier. Phase space is changed here in such a way that when you calculate the uncertainty principle that comes from that, you obtain this kind of uncertainty principle. In fact, it's a little more general because you can have a gap here and a gap there, a finite minimum uncertainty in position and or a finite minimum uncertainty in momentum. However, as this case of one dimension already indicates, this is not really tied to quantum groups. You can have this short distance structure with quantum groups or with ordinary symmetries. It's really not related to the symmetries. It's just that it came out of studies of quantum groups anyway, but um, 
So it's compatible with that, but it's not tied to the mathematics of quantum groups. You can make that uh, compatible with the usual symmetries of space-time as well. So what then is really the mathematics behind that? If it's not the deformation into quantum groups and non-commutative geometry. So sorry, you mean quantum group axon in the algebra? Yeah. So these are basically quantum planes. Um, I also wrote a paper with um, Martin Boyerwald in which we show that it depends on whether Q, a Q has got to be real for this to work. And if Q is larger than 1, you get this, larger or equal to 1. And if Q is smaller than 1, you get a structure that's a little reminiscent to structures that you get in loop quantum gravity. So what then is the mathematics behind that kind of uncertainty principle? Well, it turns out that if, if the uncertainty principle has this structure, no particular functional behavior but a gap, that's all we require. If there's a gap, if there's a finite minimum uncertainty in position, this means that fields, physical fields, must possess a finite bandwidth. You can probably see easily why the opposite is true, why the other direction is true. You see, if you have fields of a finite bandwidth, then you don't have all frequencies in them spatially or temporally. They don't have all frequencies or all wavelengths in them. But in order to produce a delta function, you need all frequencies. And the delta function is what you need in order to make delta x equal to 0. So if fields are band-limited, you get that. But you can also prove that if you have this, they are band-limited. It's a functional analytic structure that's behind this. It's the mathematics of symmetric but not self-adjoint operators on Hilbert space. But the details of that are not so important. The main thing is that this implies band limitation of the physical fields. Now, band limitation is a central concept in information theory. So, it's a central concept in information theory. But what can we, what can we then um, deduce from that? Well, it turns out that if the physical fields, if physical fields are band limited then it means that we can resolve that conundrum that we talked about earlier. Namely, if you remember, who's winning here? General relativity says space-time really ought to be a differentiable manifold. The whole framework is most naturally formulated on differentiable manifolds. Quantum field theory says, no, 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 space-time better be discrete. That's what quantization really means, discretization, literally. So who's winning here? Well, it turns out that with fields being band limited, both can win. Space time can be both discrete and continuous completely equivalently at the same time, simultaneously. Is that, like, is that anything like the wave particle nature of. Uh... It sounds like it, yes, but I haven't been able to make the, uh, the connection between the two. Really, what it's like is uh, the connection is exact, the equivalence is exact exactly the same as what you have for information. Information is simultaneously discrete and continuous. And the mathematics of that is the same as the mathematics of physical fields in this case. So this, the, the statement is that this leads to band limitation. Band limitation offers a way to see that space-time can be both discrete and continuous in exactly the same mathematical way that information can be represented both continuously and discreetly. Let me remind you how that works. <clears throat> so what is the role of band limitation in information theory? Well, information can come in continuous form, such as speech or music, to continuous signal. On the other hand, information <clears throat> can also come in the form of letters and numbers in a discrete way. When Claude Shannon in the 1940s invented or discovered information theory, he initially thought, he initially developed this information theory for this kind of information. And then he thought, well, what can we do with this? <coughs> that seems hopeless. It would seem that we have to record the amplitude of a continuous signal at every point in time in order to capture it. But how many points are there? Uncountably many. We don't even know how to start counting. So it would seem like there's just infinitely more information in a continuous signal than there is in a discrete signal. 
However, Shannon remembered a theorem that goes back ultimately to Borel and Cauchy, a theorem that now carries his name, but not because he came up with it, but because he found the key application for it in information theory. And that uh, theorem gave rise to the theory of sampling theory. It is now the bridge between continuous representations of information and discrete representations of information. It relies on band limitation. And it plays a crucial role in all of communication engineering and signal processing, in scientific data taking, for example, in astronomy. So what is that? What, what did Shannon do to unify the two forms of information? So Shannon's basic sampling theorem is this. And it's really just the basic thing of it, um, the basic um, theorem. Sampling theory is, because it's so important in engineering, uh, a very active field. And there are conferences every year. There are many journals dedicated to the subject. This is just the basics of it. So let's assume f is band limited. f is a signal, f of x, x being the real line. And to say that it's band limited means it contains only frequencies in a finite range. So it's the Fourier transform of a function over just a finite frequency interval. The maximum frequency being omega max. So let's assume f is a band-limited function, and here I plotted an example of such a function. Then the sampling theorem says that if we take samples, which is to say if we record the amplitudes of that signal at discrete points on the axis, and if those points have the uh, spacing of maximally 1 over 2 omega max, so for example, for music, typically the cutoff is about 20 kilohertz. Then the theorem requires you to take 40,000 samples per second. See, there's a factor of 2 in here. 40,000 samples per second. And then, if you record those samples, you've, you've recorded the music. Everything about it. And not just at the amplitudes. You can now reconstruct what the music is everywhere without any error in principle. I mean, there may be an error because of measurement errors. But in principle, there's no error. This is the reconstruction formula. Here are the discrete amplitudes, uh, the amplitudes at discrete points. Here's the so-called reconstruction kernel. You have to sum over all samples. And this gives you the function everywhere. And no error. This is, there's no approximation in this. You see, you can record in this way the music signal, which is definitely a continuous signal, has no trace of an underlying lattice. But you can record it on an underlying lattice, and you get everything about it. You don't have to choose particular points. You can also shift your sampling lattice to the right or to the left by any amount you like. You don't even have to take your samples equidistantly. You can leave gaps if you make up for them some other place. The reconstruction formula will become more complicated when you do that, but you can still reconstruct. You have to pay a price, which is that the sensitivity to measurement errors becomes larger. But you can still do it. These are assumed to be uniformly distributed. In this case, they are uniformly distributed. That's right. In fact, equidistantly distributed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. Um, but if you, if you make it non-equidistant, you can still reconstruct. It's just less stable. You can still do it. So what you have is that this continuous information has infinitely many representations on a lattice. And you're not tied to any particular lattice. Any discretization is as good as any other. They're all valid. You can always reconstruct perfectly. Except the, the spacing has to be, on average, at most this much. Is that, is that what happens on a compact disk? Exactly that. Yes. This reconstruction formula is um, built into any smartphone. Any CD player, any computer uses it all the, all the time. And what these conferences about sampling theory are about is, for example, what if you miss a few samples and you don't know where? and or you make some errors in the measurement, or you don't know exactly when you took the measurement. How do you handle those errors? How do they propagate? This is roughly what the field of sampling theory is about. But of course, for us, it's a matter of principle, not a matter of practicality. <clears throat> so then the properties of band-limited functions. Band-limited functions are wonderful. Their calculus is great. You see, if you know that you're dealing with functions that are band-limited, and, and you know they're band limit then for you, differential operators are now also finite difference operators. Because everything you do on the continuous function, you can do on its samples. And differential equations are also finite difference equations then, but without approximation. 
It just just are. Integrals are also series. This is exact, it's not an approximation. In fact, that is being used, for example, in pure math, in analytic, in analytic number theory. You may have some tedious theories to sum up, but how many tricks do we have to sum up series? Very few. If you write your series as an integral, by interpreting your terms as the sample values of a band-limited function, then you can use that it's also an integral and then apply tricks of integration, like contour integration, for example, to that. Limited, then uh, seems to me you can always consider it a periodic function if you want, then just by Fourier series. No, no, no. It doesn't have to be periodic. No, no. Just because so, it's so, I mean, you can, uh, if, if you take its bandwidth, then you might as well, you, one way to approach it is to extend it, imagine it being extended to be periodic. So it, You're talking about the, uh, the frequency domain. Sorry? In the frequency domain. In the frequency domain, it has a finite support. And then if you choose periodic boundary conditions on that, that gives you a particular lattice. If you choose periodic boundary conditions up to a phase, it gives you another lattice. And there are many more ways of doing that, and they correspond to the choices of sampling lattices that you have. So what then is covariant band limitation? How can we do these things covariantly for physics? Well, it means that we cut off the spectrum of the Laplacian or the D'Alembertian. Because what are frequencies other than eigenvalues of a differential operator? So the covariant way of implementing such a band limitation in quantum field theory is then, and I'm uh, writing here just the simple case of a scalar field, we write down the partition function, and instead of summing over all fields, we don't even really know what function space that ought to be, but we now limit that function space to the space of functions spanned by the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian or D'Alembertian depending on whether it's Euclidean or Lorentzian, such that the eigenvalues lie in a particular interval. If you do that on flat space, it's just ordinary band limitation. On flat Euclidean space, it's ordinary band limitation, but it's a covariant version of it that you can also do on curved space time. So you can also view it like this. The path integral tells us that most of what's happening with the field is classical. However, because of the stationary phase approximation. However, we really sum over all sorts of fluctuations. We sum over things that are arbitrarily far off shell. And this is cutting off, this band limitation is cutting off how far off shell quantum fluctuations we still take into account, not too extreme. <clears throat> so what then if physical fields are band limited? Well, then they possess equivalent representations on a differentiable space-time manifold, which shows that we can keep external symmetries, for example, if, they're killing, if there are killing vector fields, there still are after that cutting of uh, the path integral, or after that implementation of a band limitation. On the other hand, we can also represent our fields on any lattice of sufficiently dense spacing, and it doesn't break any symmetries just like we, had, we didn't do any harm to the music signal, to a band-limited music signal, by choosing a particular lattice to, to take its samples. When you reconstruct the music signal, there's no memory of the lattice from which you reconstructed it. And so similarly here. But if you do then represent your field on a lattice, that shows that you have discretized it and you can have ultraviolet finiteness. So what then is the density of degrees of freedom? Um, this question is complicated in the Lorentzian case, and I cannot, I don't have the time to explain um, how far we got with this. It's relatively simple, though, in the Euclidean case. So Euclidean signal uh, quantum field theory, we can use a, a key result by Gilkey of 1975. Gilkey showed that when you have a compact four-dimensional Riemannian manifold, then, <clears throat> in this case, we're working with the Laplacian of the manifold, so let's say we work with a plan gordon field on a compact Riemannian four-dimensional manifold. Then Gilkey's result says that the number of eigenvalues of the Laplacian below a cutoff, and the cutoff we call lambda, so that would be our band limitation, we're cutting off the spectrum of the Laplacian. The number of eigenvalues that remain, and therefore the number of eigenfunctions that remain, after we implement that cutoff, and therefore the dimensionality of the Hilbert space of scalar fields that remains is given by that expression here. 
That is also, now we see from the perspective of sampling theory, this is also the number of samples that you have to take in order to capture a field completely. Generally, if your function space is 